Good afternoon, everyone, again, and welcome to the second plenary of Energy Finance 2022, Local Leadership, Global Change. We want to uh, welcome both of our uh, folks who are, are here in person at the New York Academy of Medicine and our online audience who's joining us through the live stream. I'm pleased to introduce Hindun Malaika, who will moderate this session. Hindun is a senior finance strategist at the Tara Climate Foundation, who works closely with civil society organization partners to shift investment toward the parents aligned decarbonization goals and to accelerate clean energy in Asia. I'd now like to turn this in over to Hindun, who will introduce our panel. Great, thank you, Sandy. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to AIVA Energy, uh, Energy Finance Conference, uh, the second plenary sessions. It is my honor to be a moderator for local leadership and global change sessions with three great speakers who will be presenting today. So I'm Hindun Mulaika. I am the Regional Finance Strategist at Tara Climate Foundations, and I will be serving as your moderator today. So climate change is the most depressing issue nowadays. A CDP report points out that 100 energy companies have been responsible for more than 70% of all industrial emissions. Businesses have an enormous responsibility towards the climate disasters. Across the globe, community and environmental advocates are leading effective campaigns and taking legal actions to accelerate the electricity sector transitions and prevent uh, costly fossil fuel infrastructure investment and influence financial institutions' decisions. Our speakers will share highlights and insight from, the, from their groundbreaking work, and we will learn that one extensive campaign against fossil fuel industry is built out of massive interconnected puzzle from community organizing policy advocacies and most likely in combinations of legal actions. It is very often requires cross-border effort to challenge all these global players. We are at the critical time in human history trying to stop new expansions of invest, uh, fossil fuel investment projects because we cannot afford to live with climate polluting energy resources anymore. So, uh, I will briefly introduce you to our guest speakers. So we have Melinda, Melinda Janki with me. Uh, so Melinda is an international lawyer of over 30 years standing, fighting to stop deep water oil productions that is endangering the rich marine biodiversity offshore Guyana. She holds an LLB from University College London and two master degrees in law, the BCL from Hertford College, Oxford University and LLM in Public International Law from University College London. Melinda was admitted to practice as a solicitor in England in 1988 and as an attorney at law in Guyana in 1994. The second speaker will be Eugene Kim. So Eugene is a founder and CEO of Solutions for Our Climate, SFOC, based in Seoul. Prior to founding SFOC, he conducted numerous energy-related projects as a lawyer at Kim and Chang, Korea's largest law firm. Eugene currently serves as a member of the Power Market Surveillance Committee under the Electricity Regulatory Commissions of the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy and member of Carbon Neutrality Committee of the Chungnam Province. Until 2021, he was an expert committee member of the National Council on Climate and Air Quality convened by the presidents of the Republic Korea. And last uh, but not least, we have Tracy Carlucio, who is the deputy director of the Loire River Keeper Network, an organization she helped found in 1989. Dedicated to defending the Delaware River watershed, they work locally, watershed-wide, and at the state and national level to protect the watershed and its communities, human and non-human, and for the world where future generations will thrive. So I will start first with uh, having Melinda to present 
and then go next with Eugene and Tracy, and then we will have Q&A sessions after the speaker's presentations have concluded. So please, Melinda. Good afternoon. Thank you, Aifa, for inviting me to be part of this wonderful conference, and thank you, Hindun, for that very gracious introduction. My presentation is Exxon's Guyana Project. Should investors be concerned? This talk is not about climate change. You know, uh, fossil fuels pollute the atmosphere with greenhouse gas, which causes global warming, which leads to extreme events like Hurricane Ian, rising sea levels, melting ice caps. Greenhouse gas is also making the ocean more acid. I'm not gonna take up your time with what you already know. The talk is also not about Guyana's petroleum deal with Exxon and its partners. I've analyzed this deal elsewhere as one of the most abusive and exploitative deals ever inflicted on a sovereign people. So I won't spend time on that now either. And I'm not going to talk about a just transition. Guyana is a carbon sink. We are already a climate leader. So not climate change, not the bad oil deal, not a just transition. What's left? Three things, three things that Exxon's investors should be concerned about. One, the global energy market. Two, ongoing litigation in Guyana. And three, the risk of a well blowout. Everything I say to you is in the public domain. I'm going to show you why it matters. Now, no one is impartial or neutral. I used to work for BP. Also, we all have conceptual frameworks. And what I'm saying to you is influenced by many people, but also Friedrich Hayek's work, The Road to Serfdom. So first, the global energy market. Now, Exxon says it's found 11 billion barrels of oil offshore Guyana, and it's spending billions of dollars to get that oil. This is a project for 20 or more years. But how long can it really last? Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of England, has warned that there's a carbon bubble of trillions of dollars in the global economy. How much of this 11 billion barrels of oil is already stranded assets? Now, Hayek points out that the system of competition depends on the property owner being able to benefit from the useful services rendered by his property and suffering for all of the damage caused to others by its use. Governments have distorted competition by allowing the fossil fuel sector to pollute without paying for the damage. Politics is propping up fossil fuels. Last week, AIFA produced a report called Two Economies Collide, Competition, Conflict, and the Financial Case for Fossil Fuel Divestment. The report states, market forces favor fossil fuel competitors. Politics now drives oil and gas prices, with the war in the Ukraine serving as a vivid reminder of this stark reality. Rather than take you through the report, I would really like to recommend this report to you. Now, renewable energy is cheaper, safer, and more reliable than fossil fuels. Other sectors are outperforming fossil fuels. So prudent investors are going to divest. But who is going to be left with stranded assets and worthless shares. The question for investors is no longer, should I divest from fossil fuels, but how fast can I divest without affecting the share price or even triggering a collapse? The second reason investors should have some concerns is litigation. Guyana has strong rules to protect the environment, I know, because I drafted the Environmental Protection Act. Hayek says 
the rule of law distinguishes a free country from a country under arbitrary government. It means government's actions are bound by fixed rules and the rules must apply to everybody. But in Guyana, it appears that the rules are not being applied to everybody. There are five cases in court which could affect Exxon's oil drilling and I act for the litigants in each case. Case one, Mr. Gaskin says that the petroleum minister illegally granted a petroleum production license to Exxon and its partners. ESSO is Exxon's subsidiary. The case is in the Court of Appeal. If the court agrees with Mr. Gaskin, the court could cancel the petroleum production license. ESSO would then have to stop production and apply for a new license. Mr. Gaskin also says that ESSO and its partners are in breach of the Companies Act. If the court agrees with Mr. Gaskin, the court could order ESSO and partners to file full and detailed company accounts on their finances instead of branch accounts. Case two, Dr. Thomas and Mr. De Freitas say that oil production is illegal because it violates their right to a healthy environment. 20 years ago, I successfully lobbied for this right to a healthy environment to be put into the constitution and it's in the enforceable bit of the constitution. The case is in its early stages. ESSO says that greenhouse gas pollution and its impacts are matters of scientific opinion, not fact. And they've applied to strike out many of Dr. Thomas's statements. Dr. Thomas also refers to public statements by ExxonMobil and its chief executive officer, Darren Woods, admitting climate change. ESSO says this is hearsay and should be struck out. Now this all has to be dealt with before the case can proceed. But ultimately, if the court agrees with Dr. Thomas and Mr. De Freitas, the court could declare that oil production is unconstitutional and the government would be expected to stop ESSO's oil production. Case three, flaring. Ms. Ne Ms. Henry, Ms. Nagir, and Ms. Torrington say that the EPA changed ESSO's environmental permit to allow flaring and that they acted illegally when they did so. If the court agrees with the litigants that the Environmental Protection Agency acted illegally, ESSO would have to stop flaring. Now, in his affidavit in court, Alistair Routledge, the head of ESSO, said, the current flaring from the floating production storage offloading vessel, the FPSO, with the exception of identified operational flaring by design, is the result of partial mechanical failure of the flash gas compression system. He also said that the flash gas compression system has had multiple repairs, and although it is currently operating ab aboard the FPSO, it is still experiencing a partial failure, making it unable to meet its design specifications. The litigants raise concerns about the use of this faulty equipment. They want the court to shut down SO's operations until the EPA provides an independent expert report that it is safe to allow ESSO to restart petroleum operations. Case four, Ms. Henry and Ms. Radzig say that the EPA broke the law when it issued a new permit to ESSO in June without an environmental impact assessment. If the court agrees with them, ESSO could lose this new permit and have to stop producing oil until it applies for and obtains a new environmental permit. Case five is different. It's about the money. 
Now, the environmental permit requires ESSO to provide insurance, and it also requires a parent company indemnity to indemnify and keep indemnified the Environmental Protection Agency and the government of Guyana against ESSO's environmental obligations in the area that is the Stabrook block, which is where they're drilling. The litigants say that there is no limit to liability under the permit or under national law. So if the court agrees with the litigants, ExxonMobil could have on its books unlimited liability. The litigants say the court must order the EPA to provide copies of the insurance and the unlimited liability so the Guyanese people know that these things are in place as legally required. And if they're not, Mr. Collins and Mr. White say that the court should cancel the permit. We know that applicants can win in court in Guyana. There is a sixth case which has been completed, and that case cut ESSO's permits, environmental permits, down from 23 years to five years. I come now to the third reason for concern, which is safety. Deep water drilling is dangerous. ESSO is drilling where the ocean is a mile deep and the oil is two miles below the seabed. Now, obviously, investors factor in the risks of well blowouts, oil spills, and so on when they make their decisions. But they also assume that oil companies will operate safely, taking into account technology, conditions, and legal requirements. Is that the case? with ESSO. In an investor call in 2020, Exxon told investors that ESSO had achieved first oil in Guyana under budget and ahead of schedule. First oil, December 2019. By January 2020, fishermen reported seeing flames in the sky. ESSO then admitted it was flaring billions of cubic feet of gas. The reason? The faulty equipment mentioned earlier. The environmental impact assessment says safe production is 120,000 barrels a day. There have been reports recently that ESSO is producing at 150,000 barrels a day. The EPA has fined ESSO for some spills. There was another spill recently. Any failure of procedures, however small, could lead to a major catastrophe. You remember the BP Macondo well blowout, which cost BP more than 70 billion BP and partners. Offshore Guyana could be more. ESSO's maps show that oil from a well blowout could spread through the Caribbean and foul Caribbean beaches. Caribbean tourism and fishing sectors would be affected. The cost of damage could be over 100 billion. Exxon could be potentially liable if the court requires the indemnity mentioned earlier. A well blowout could also mean the end of oil drilling offshore Guyana. If so, how do investors get back their money? The Guyanese people, the litigants, are doing everything to keep Guyana safe. There will be more court cases to uphold the rule of law and protect the Caribbean. But it's clear that regulatory failures by the government and the EPA are not good for investment. On the contrary, regulatory failures significantly increase the dangers of deep water drilling and increase investment risk. In summary, investors should be concerned at the risks from a changing energy market, from the litigation to uphold the rule of law, and from unsafe operations. The era of fossil fuels is over. We can and will invest in a better, more prosperous and sustainable future. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Ju Jin. It's great to be here uh, after three years of virtual meetings. 
Uh, I would like to also thank uh, Aifa for inviting me here today and uh, giving me the opportunity to share the story. Uh, I remember when I was at Columbia University for the re most recent uh, in-person Aifa conference, um, the topic, one of the topics for the Asia region was coal finance. Uh, and uh, I remember Julian, Julian Vincent is over there, a good companion of mine on coal finance. Um, uh, fortunately, that, that era, the, the, the age where uh, uh, Asian public financial institutions have been providing public finance for uh, power projects, coal power projects, in Southeast Asia is done. Uh, uh, of course, there are remnants of the coal finance that we have to encounter and, 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 and challenge, but uh, uh, the end of coal finance has led our team um, to look into oil and gas finance, especially oil and gas finance in, by South Korean public financial institutions. And this is, I mean, uh, uh, um, I, I brought today a story that uh, we tried to build up uh, in that process. Uh, our team started to look into oil and gas finance uh, a couple of years ago and found out a couple of features um, from that work. Uh, first of all, it's a 13, 13 time larger challenge. Whereas coal finance from the Korean public financial institution perspectives was about $10 billion for 10 years, uh, oil and gas finance is $130 billion, roughly $130 billion per, for, the, for 10 years. About half of that goes into shipyards, shipyards which build oil and gas carriers, uh, drill ships, uh, maritime plants, FPSOs, uh, floating LNG terminals, floating LNG ships. The Korean shipyards build about 70 to 80 percent of the world's oil, oil carrier, crude oil carriers, or the LNG carriers, making it kind of like uh, the global maritime oil and gas pipeline. So that's the second thing we found out. Uh, and while doing this study, um, we, we encountered, we, we found out a project that uh, a Korean company was lingering around, was trying to get into. Uh, and we also found a very well-established Australian local campaign built around it. Actually, uh, and um, I have a short video uh, going into that before going into the story uh, of, that, of that campaign. Um, I must mention, that uh, um, most of the stories that I'm talking to right now, talking about right now, is actually work that I haven't done. My colleague, who's also here with me in New York, is the person who main led, along with all kinds of other organizations whose names you'll see pop up uh, uh, during the discussion today. So, um, video, please. Caldita is a natural gas development project off the northern coast of Australia, driven by Australian oil company Santos and South Korean SKENS. The project had been delayed for several years, but last March, the project owners eventually reached a financial investment decision, which means they can proceed with the actual development of the project now. The Barossa gas project is situated 260 kilometers north of Darwin in the Timor Sea. The Timor Sea is an incredibly productive sea between northern Australia and, in, and Indonesia. Over 6,000 tonnes of tropical snappers get harvested from these waters every year. If the Barossa gas project went ahead, it would pose some grave environmental risks for this area. The Northern Territory makes up about one-sixth of Australia's landmass and will experience the impacts of climate change more than almost any other place in Australia and many places on Earth. The area has a massive marine park called the Oceanic Shoals Marine Park. Their pipeline will run within six kilometres of the western Tiwi Islands. This area is Australia's largest and most important nesting area for the Olive Ridley sea turtles. A very important species in Australia and a very important species for the Tiwi traditional owners.
The problem is we can't afford to develop any more gas at this point. Gas is misperceived as a bridge fuel, a cleaner and a more climate friendly fuel compared to coal. But in reality, when we consider the life cycle emissions, it's that not actually true. Specifically, Barossa Caldita project is, is probably the most carbon intensive gas well ever developed in the world. 18% of its reserve is carbon dioxide. And from this project, more CO2 will be produced than the amount of gas actually produced. There's a growing awareness in the Northern Territory that continuing to extract gas, including from the Barossa project, will accelerate climate collapse here and make life here virtually unlivable for everyone, including traditional Aboriginal owners who have cared for the land in the Northern Territory for many, many millennia. We're going to see here temperatures that exceed 35 degrees Celsius for over 300 days a year, creating a tipping point for habitability in Darwin. This is not just a development project by a company. It's, it's going to create direct and irreversible impact on our uh, carbon budget, which we cannot afford. So we need to raise voices against the corporations and also the government that, that is supporting this project. It's becoming more and more urgent that we stop the Barossa project. And the No Barossa campaign is aimed at doing just that. It's aimed at saving the Northern Territory from climate collapse. Well, I hope you gave, that video gave you a little bit of idea of what the project is about. I'll go into the more specific details of the project. Um, two things are produced from the gas fields about 300 kilometers outside of Darwin, Northern Territory, Australia. Uh, gas and condensate, which is a form of gas in liquid. The gas will be transferred through a pipeline to Darwin, where there's an LNG terminal, and from the LNG terminal, it will be offloaded to LNG ships sent over to Korea, Japan, wherever. The condensate will be processed right above the gas field through an FPSO, a floating processing storage and offloading unit, uh, a really, really expensive ship, a $4.6 billion ship, um, and put onto crude carriers to send it over to wherever it, it's needed. Um, you see a lot of subcontractors. I mean, given the, the, the ship itself is, is being built in a Singaporean shipyard, uh, but you also see a lot of ship, ship a lot of stakeholders around, including uh, Sub-C7, NOV, all C, all chipping in to the project. Uh, there's a lot of CO2 coming out of the carbon dioxide coming out from the project as well. Uh, according to the project developers, what they're going to do with the CO2, um, they will transfer, I mean, basically the CO2 will be processed at the Darwin LNG terminal and sent over and injected into the Bayou Undan, Bayou Undan gas field, which is a depleting gas field, uh, and for which uh, the LNG terminal in Darwin was developed. So this project is practically a second phase of using the Darwin LNG facilities. The most difficult, environmentally difficult part of the project, as mentioned in the video, is that the CO2 carbon dioxide content inside the gas field is pretty high. Uh, according to AIFA, which has done a lot of re great research on, on this topic, uh, it's one of the most carbon intensive projects, LNG projects in Australia. And this has been the most difficult part for the companies involved in the project to explain. And here, this is where CCS comes in and the blue hydrogen argument come in and the greenwashing uh, related, relevant to that also comes in. This has led the CO2 carbon capture and storage Green, uh, uh, blue hydrogen arguments has led to multiple lawsuits, both in, both in Australia and Korea, on whether this project is environmentally friendly. In Australia, uh, the Envi Environmental Defender's Office, on behalf of ACCR, has filed one of Australia's first greenwashing claims, uh, claiming, saying that Santos's net zero claim is, is not true. Uh, we, our team has also filed lawsuits in, in the Korean, to the Korean 
Ministry of Environment and the Fair Trade Commission saying that the claim that this gas is CO2 free gas is wrong. Uh, and our case has eventually prevailed. Um, SKENS has changed its, uh, uh, how it changed how it represents the gas from the project. But the true, I think the true development, true, the, the, the project has become a lot more, our work around the project has become more colorful with the traditional owners coming inside and putting a face to the development of the project. The traditional owners of the Tiwi Islands, you've seen in the video that the, Tiwi, the pipeline will pass through uh, just right in front of the Tiwi Islanders where Tiwi Island, where, where uh, important turtles live. Um, they, although they, their importance as a stake, stakeholder in the project, they have been mainly left out uh, during the environmental permitting process and even, even during the initial discussions of how to build the campaign around this and gaining their trust was an important topic. The breakthrough with the TY and came earlier this year uh, when our team filed a lawsuit uh, against the Korean uh, public financial institutions saying that you should, uh, you should suspend the financing of the project. We never intended to win from this lawsuit. Uh, our project, our, our, our goal with that lawsuit was to delay the project. What I asked specifically to the lawyer that was, we were hired for this one was just to get two hearings, that's enough. Just let our case be heard enough. Um, and we eventually did. And what eventually happened with the lawsuit was the delay, the, the approval of the uh, public financing was delayed for several months. We had a presidential election in between, fortunately, and it was delayed. It also, uh, most importantly, gained the confidence of the community inside the TV island. And that led to the second lawsuit in Australia. Environmental Defender's Office successfully led uh, a lawsuit against the uh, environmental authorities, uh, uh, in, against the authorities in Australia. Uh, and the Australian federal court has ruled that there was a flaw inside the environmental permit, and therefore the project approval is not valid. And there, after that, the project has been suspended. Of course, Santos is appealing the, the, that lawsuit. And uh, I believe the development activity has currently, is currently uh, stopped. Of course, there's going to be a lot of more legal fights after this. Uh, but uh, I guess the process kind of shows you how the project, which began as, as, a, as our work around the project, which began as a small local campaign, we were also kind of trying to figure out what, what oil and gas is and expand to a more uh, engaged, community-involved, uh, and global, I would say, uh, campaign discussion. So what I've learned, um, after working, seeing my colleagues, as I said, I, I haven't been doing a lot of work on this project. My colleagues have mainly done uh, a couple of years uh, looking at the work around this project is that, number one, you don't know whether something will not work or work until you actually do it. Uh, we were also pretty shy when we, were start, when we started to work on this project. Uh, we had many doubts, especially when the lawsuit I mentioned, two hearings, we had many doubts on whether this would be effective, but well, we had nothing to lose. So we, we gave it a try, and I think that has helped expand the community around it. Uh, that leads to my second point. There is no silver bullet in, I think, winning in these things. Uh, it's eventually, I say it in, in, my, in my language, uh, it's not that much different from selling entrance. Uh, it's basically going around knocking doors and, uh, and talking to people what you think about and kind of proving that you're right. And increasing that community is, also, is, is pretty much, I think, what eventually wins these things. Uh, oil and gas finance is, is a much more, has a much more complex scene. Uh, there are a variety of issues involved, greenwashing, carbon capture and storage, shipbuilding, gas power. And we haven't even scratched the surface of the shipbuilding or ship financing industry dynamics associated with the Barossa gas project. So there's a lot more work to do. And I hope to have a lot of great discussions on, on this topic uh, during the next two days. But once again, thank you very much for inviting me.
Hello, I'm Tracy Carluccio. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. I'm going to give an example of how my organization and our coalition of groups fight dirty energy projects. My organization is dedicated to the Delaware River watershed, which includes portions of New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware, and we work at the state and federal level as well in order to try to get protective policies and laws in place that will prevent pollution and degradation of our watershed. And we fight individual projects that threaten the water watershed. The example I'm going to use today of a dirty energy project is, is the liquefied natural gas project proposed on the Delaware River at Gibbs Town. And it has all the bad aspects of a dirty energy project. It has, it's in the wrong location. It has polluting emissions. It has outsized impacts and threats to public safety, difficult logistics at the, at the terminal site and at every way along the, the delivery chain. And it has an outsized and unacceptable disproportionate impact on an environmental justice communities. And these are some of the reasons that we're fighting this project. The, from the fracked wells up in Pennsylvania, where they wanna um, extract the gas for this project, there's an enormous footprint that goes all the way down to Gibbstown. The fracked gas wells um, would have to be uh, developed in order to feed feedstock gas to the proposed liquefied natural gas plant they want to build in Bradford County in the north central part of Pennsylvania. Then they want to travel 200 miles with liquefied natural gas on rail and or trucks through hundreds of Pennsylvania and New Jersey communities across the Delaware River and finally down to the Gibbstown site where you see that ship there. And the terminal itself has many, many environmental impacts along, along with the Bigfoot trend of this project. And they include, for instance, the Atlantic sturgeon, a federally endangered species that has a unique ecotype to the Delaware River watershed. And when it's gone from the earth and there's only about 250 animals left, it'll be gone. And also the possibility and the likely potential of the release of toxic chemicals from the site. PCBs and other highly toxic nitrobenzene and aniline because this site is not completely cleaned up and was a munitions, munitions facility operated by DuPont for over 100 years. Community impacts are illustrated here in this picture where you see the rail line, the red line going through Philadelphia and Camden, New Jersey. Those dots that you see there, they're daycare centers their schools and the communities in the area that's highlighted around there within two miles are densely populated by people of color and low income communities. And then as it moves through and threatening those communities, it goes down to the terminal site, which also has uh, threats for environmental justice communities. The area impacts can be illustrated here where enormous ships, the largest bulk carrier, uh, liquid carriers that would operate on the Delaware River would leave the dock there and then travel down the Delaware River, uh, about 84 river miles a relatively narrow river and a relatively narrow navigation channel past communities in Delaware and South Jersey. All of these impacts have required that we take action at a lot of different levels, and many groups are involved in doing that. Delaware Riverkeeper Network has, has appealed all of the major permits for the terminal project. Other organizations have appealed the air permit for the liquefaction plant they want to build in Pennsylvania. And many of us are involved in deliberations at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials safety administration who have pending decisions they are making regarding this project that could have precedent for many LNG projects like this. And those impacts have required us to stay on this and to do it through a diversified way. 
Here you see the, the ships where they would travel down the navigation channel right past Wilmington. That's why Wilmington adopted a resolution opposing this project. And in fact, 20 local governments have adopted resolutions opposing the LNG project at Gibbstown. And over 100,000 people have submitted petitions, participated, making substantial comments, and attended and spoken up at hearings to try to affect the decision makers about this project. And all of this means that we, that as people find out about this project, the uh, opposition to it deepens. The regional considerations, as you can see here, are probably no better illustrated than the disconnect of this project from regional context. The state of Delaware has regulations that ban liquefied natural gas terminals in their coastal zone. And it has been in place for decades. And it's because of public safety and incompatibility with other river uses. How is it just and equitable that these ships would be filing by all of the, the Delaware coastal communities and would also threaten the Chester right across the way and other northeastern, uh, northwestern uh, communities in, the, in Delaware itself, since it's only six miles from the border. But the damages and the threats and the impacts don't stop at that border. The climate crisis will be fed by the LNG that is produced for this project particularly in Pennsylvania and the Marcellus Shale, where they plan to develop the gas. And this climate crisis, of course, is how we have a global impact, a national impact through this project. And this, the, this problem is no better illustrated than the fact that the companies that are building this project are trying to wide, ride the wave of increasing LNG exports to Europe, even though it was never billed as being a project that would send uh, gas to Europe. Mainly it was to uh, sell gas to Caribbean and Mexican uh, ports. But nevertheless, they're trying to bank on what the rest of the world is doing and say that now they're going to be sending freedom molecule molecules over to Europe. Um, and of course, the watershed communities um, don't accept this. We think uh, for the Gibbstown facility, it's more about inducing fracking, throwing a lifesaver to a floundering industry in Pennsylvania, um, and trying to make a lot of money for companies that basically would make a killing getting the highest price they possibly could for selling the gas overseas. And we think it's disgraceful. So probably one of the most important things we need to do if we want to look closely at New Fortress Energy, the corporation behind the Gibbstown project, requires an examination of their financial condition. As the IEFA report New Fortress Energy promises to keep points out, the business model for New Fortress Energy supports the expansion of natural gas use around the world. And of course, this directly conflicts with our global climate goals. New Fortress Energy speculates in a slew of ventures, and that includes LNG exports on the Gulf Coast, what they call fast LNG on foreign nations, and other energy projects. But their success in delivering on their development pro promises has been lackluster. We see this corporate uncertainty as key in helping us develop our strategies to fight and defeat this project. The project is not yet constructed. It's been delayed, and theoretically, they could start construction at any time, but it's a guess guessing game to try to figure out what, what they're actually doing there. The builders of this project have played deceitful cat and mouse games about their intentions. It's a standard operating procedure that has been emblematic of how they have secretly and aggressively sought agency nods and approvals behind closed doors, segmented agency reviews wherever they could, and publicly used classic bait and switch tactics in an attempt to fool the public. But their strategy hasn't borne fruit yet. 
For example, the communities where New Fortress Energy wants to import the LNG are fighting back. They're resisting this. And as we have heard in other speakers, uh, Puerto Rico, they, they want to develop Puerto, Rico, uh, Puerto Rican renewable and truly clean energy sources. They don't want to be defended, uh, dependent on gas from uh, New Fortress Energy, especially since it's about four times as expensive or more uh, than renewable Puerto Rican controlled uh, sources that benefit the Puerto Rican community. And in Ireland, the coalition government there and the communities that we've connected with through seminars say they don't want dirty frack gas from America. They want to break free. The proposed Gibbstown liquefied natural gas export term terminal is only about just under two miles from Chester, Pennsylvania. We're very concerned that other LNG projects are going to crop up in our watershed, and that, that's not an unfounded fear. A company has already set its sights on Chester to try to build a liquefied natural gas liquefier and export terminal there in much larger dimensions than what's being proposed for Gibbstown. We are standing shoulder to shoulder with the people in Chester and the well-established, well-accomplished environmental justice organization there that has said, over my dead body, are you going to come into Chester and develop LNG? <laughs> Gibbstown and Chester could be the tip of an iceberg in the Delaware River watershed. The Delaware River Port Complex is the largest freshwater port in the world. And over the last decades, the refineries that have shut down and the chemical plants that have shut down have developed ripe brown fields that companies are looking to redevelopment, just like the Gibbstown site at the polluted DuPont facility and just like the Chester facility with their eyes set on the, Ford, the now closed Ford manufacturing plant. We're not gonna let this happen. Nobody in the Delaware River watershed, the people who have fought so hard to turn our river from what was once an absolutely polluted river that couldn't even support life into one that's transforming into an environment where people, all people, have clean air, clean water, and equal access to that, where human and non-human communities have habitats they can thrive in, not just survive. And decades of work and many levels of government as well as people fighting at the, at the very bottom level have made that happen. And certainly, uh, New Fortress Energy and PEN America and the other LNG uh, producers are not going to take that away from us. If the project is built, it would be the first LNG project in New Jersey, it would be the first in the Delaware River watershed, and it would be only the third on the East Coast. This is a trend that we're resisting, and we believe that if we manage to do that, that we will be able to keep this bubble that's supporting LNG and the frenzy of gas fracking out of ruining our watershed. I'd like to close by quoting an American civil and environmental rights leader, Dr. Benjamin Chavis, Jr. And he recently said in a speech at Duke University in North Carolina, the future is what we shape it to be. The future does not occur by osmosis, it's how it's shaped. And he said, as you see here, we have nothing but opportunity today to change injustice. Yes, we're at an inflection point. We believe that. And we want to use that inflection point to accomplish real change. We aim for a future from the ground up in order to affect, in order to make change at the global scale. Thank you.
Thank you for all the outstanding presentations. For me, this is really like an encouraging and awakening call that we shouldn't lose hope because we have them and we have everybody here. So uh, if you have any questions, please go to the AIL and get the microphone, give us your name and also the organizations. And for all these online participants, like please use uh, the chat functions and then please give your name, organizations, and then send the questions to the chat box. So anyone have a questions? I, I probably can start first. Uh, I can start with Melinda. So how do you see the power of legal actions in creating a systemic change, uh, especially in the energy sector? You have been running, I think, almost like six cases. Okay, like six cases in total. Yeah, please. Thank you very much. So I, I think actually what I'd like to start off with saying is that litigation depends very much on people who are actually willing to challenge the energy sector. And so if you don't have that grassroots opposition, if you don't have people in country prepared to stand up, if you don't have the people's movements, then the litigation isn't actually going to have people to, to go to court and to say, stop it. Once you have that, though, I think litigation is a very powerful part of the opposition to fossil fuels because courts have power and they can force governments to do things. Courts have power and they can force the fossil fuel sector to stop doing things. So it's part of the story and litigation can be transformational, but I want to stress that it's only part of the story. It's probably the part of the story that I know the best, um, but it is very much dependent on the other work that is being done by people in civil space. Great. Thank you, Melinda. Is there any questions from the audience? Okay, I'll, I'll go to Eugene. So, um, Eugene, the threat of greenwashing, I think, seems to be more and more challenging nowadays. And then uh, most of these big fossil fuel industries are now developing what's so-called transition technology or new innovative technology, as you mentioned, like hydrogen, CCUS. And then they actually equip themselves with all these green labels, right? So how do you see uh, that? this is something that is more challenging. I think in comparison to the previous like coal campaign that it is easier for us sometimes to associate coal with the dirtiest energy source. Uh, so now really like the reality with all this greenwashing that got all this within the taxonomy sometimes and other, you know, like financing, sustainable finance product in quotation. So how, how do you see this is more challenging for the work, do you think? Compared to coal. Yes. I think uh, the challenge is pretty similar. Mm -hmm. It does take time. And um, uh, the slides I've shown you is the process of trying to make people understand that uh, gas is not good. Gas is not the transition fuel. Um, and it's working. Um, coal actually was not easy at the beginning. When we first began with coal, we did have the benefit of using a more intuitive argument on air pollution. but there's a limit to that. You have to eventually prove that the future of climate depends on what our decisions on that, which eventually worked. Um, that power sector coal is expensive, which eventually is working as well. Uh, so, um, and, and the challenges with gas, oil and gas is pretty much the same. Pretty much the same, and it's, I mean, it's, it's a 13 time larger challenge. But uh, if you keep telling the truth to the people, they eventually get it and we're seeing symptoms of that great thank you is there any welcome any questions from the audience here is there any okay please hello um definitely name is omar el maui from with the stop east african crude pipeline campaign 
Um, and, and I agree, and, and thanks for the discussion. I mean, despite I was struggling to be awake because it's almost midnight where I'm coming from, um, but it's, it's a good discussion. And, and the challenge with uh, litigation, if I would ask, uh, is the fact that sometimes it takes quite a while to be able to push. Um, and knowing, because I've been involved with the Lamu coal plant case, and I've seen how long sometimes it takes, um, it, it demoralizes and doesn't necessarily uh, push a lot of funders uh, to give funding to support you and to keep uh, pushing with the work that needs to be done. So maybe uh, Melinda or the rest of you who've utilized it, what are sort of the tactics that you've utilized to make sure that you, know, you keep motivating and make sure that you have the support that you need to keep pushing uh, things forward. And then finally has also been the tactic around uh, you know, while we are strategizing and litigating and pushing uh, against these injustices, we're also seeing the fossil fuel companies also strategizing on their part. Uh, we've seen many people being uh, either slap suited, you know, uh, civil uh, litigation against uh, public uh, participation and many other strategies we're seeing. Um, so are, are you seeing like uh, a, a, a slowdown in some of these cases? Or are they still happening? Um, and, and is it in many ways also something that sort of makes people not want to go down that path uh, because, you know, the fossil fuel companies have their own uh, uh, big number of people who are in their payroll and they're happy to like keep drowning you with many, many other stupid challenges that they're going to be bringing on your side. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, Melinda and then probably Tracy. Thanks. Okay, um, yes, thank you very much indeed. And I think that you pointed out some of the really tough challenges of litigation against fossil fuel companies. Um, you know, when I filed the first case, which was in 2018, I only had, there was one lawyer who was prepared to come in on the case and he didn't even live in Guyana. He was, he's in Trinidad, wonderful senior counsel. And I didn't have any other help and I would actually literally line up in the registry with the lawyers clerks in order to get the documents filed. So I think you just start where you are and you do what's necessary and you just you just have to keep going and as you do that more and more people will join. So we did the first case in 2018, one in 2020, one in 2021 and three in 20 22 so there you get you get the momentum and um and people will keep going the first case also um was completely unfunded the cases are not uh particularly well funded but again um you just got to keep going the fossil fuel sector is big and it's powerful that's just the way it is it's big it's powerful and it's on its way out because actually it's not powerful. <laughs> yes, I, I agree with that. Um, one of the things that we have found to be very important is connecting the dots of all the different pieces of a project. That's why we look at it from the gas that they want to frack in Pennsylvania and all along that dangerous transportation route and then the terminal and then the ships uh, going by communities in, in New Jersey and, and Delaware, as well as Pennsylvania, and then the end point. And connecting all those dots, we feel, is really the only way we're really going to get a comprehensive picture at what the impact of a project is going to be. The Gibbstown Terminal is one point in a big chain, and we had to look at the whole chain of, uh, of this project in order to understand it and then also to help people understand it. And really, we found that the more people find out about what these trains are going to be going right past my house, um, the more people have gotten engaged and opposed it. And getting local governments to pass resolutions, for instance, is very, very important. And it sometimes takes a whole year to get one passed. Um, but it, it's, you know, so it serves multiple purposes, like uh, educating people what's going on, helping the local government elected officials see what the truth is, rather than swallowing wholesale what the company is giving out. Um, so I think really engagement is the issue here, and, in, and connecting the dots is the, 
absolutely essential in order to engage everybody. There's more power when you're united. Great. Thank you, Tracy. Please. This is a follow-up to that excellent question. For Jujin, you said that on your slide about what you learned, that you learned that you should never give up until you've tried it. Can you tell us about the moment when you realized that it was going to work or that you had enough hope to keep pushing and how that affected the trajectory of the project from that time? Thank you. Um, well, there wasn't, I, I can't say there was a moment, but um, it's these small wins. I mean, in the process, uh, I mean, first it was, I mean, my colleagues said they were, they were working on this project called Verosa. Yuki was at the beginning uh, when we were working, beginning work on this project as well. Um, um, and my, my comment to them was, well, give it a try. And, uh, and uh, they did work a lot. Um, and I could see them gain confidence. Uh, when they, when, when my colleagues started to work on greenwashing and the greenwashing case, and it, it actually did deliver some blows uh, in the media, media gained traction. Um, you've seen a lot of good articles up there, um, not, not just in international media, but also in the local media as well. Um, kind of sensing that, oh, maybe people may be more opposed to this project than to this kind of work than we thought. Um, it was accumulation of that. The court was also something. Um, and we've seen how the public financial institutions suffered from lawsuits and the scrutinization that comes in from that. Um, lately, we've been seeing our legislatures jump in, legislators jumping in on the project. So that kind of piling up kind of sees, gets, gives you a sense that, oh, this might work. Maybe this project may go. But if the same thing happens for a second round in a different project, for example, in Mozambique, then we're going to nail it. And actually, that's the way coal finance went down. Um, you kind of sense that that kind of opinion growing and, and, and kind of getting out of control the people who are developing the projects. Um, that's how I think we gain confidence. Thank you. Yes. Name and organizations, please. Sure. Uh, Arturo Garcia Costas, uh, Program Officer for the Local, National, and International Environment with the New York Community Trust. Uh, I very much appreciated your presentations and particularly the focus on two communities of influence, the legal community and the finance community. But um, in the last 20 years, I have struggled with the fact that both of those communities, the legal community and the finance community, are operating sometimes with intentional ignorance or lack of information or unintentional. In the case of the legal community, and the rule of law uh, around the world, uh, the trust has supported this thing called the Climate Judiciary Project, of course, the United States Climate Judiciary Project that is trying to get judges to understand climate science better since more cases are coming before them. Uh, and it originally focused in the United States, now it's focusing as well internationally through the World Commission on Environmental Law. And we've also been uh, doing some grant making on the finance community. But the thing with the finance community is, finance rather community, is that they are betting on failure. They're betting on paralysis. I have been in several conversations and meetings over the past year where I can tell the person speaking is like, that the government is not going to be able to do anything. So while the government is paralyzed, while it's not going to be effective, we are going to continue to address the short termism and these uh, and do these investments and everything else. So it becomes a self fulfilling prophecy. So my question, I'm sorry to be a bit a soapboxy here, is that with those two, two communities of of influence, what is the way of actually breaking through these log jams of ignorance, intentional willful ignorance and unintentional ignorance of climate science and other issues. So the, so the two communities are Uh, thank you. I think that was a, an excellent question. And if I understand correctly, the two communities are the legal community and the finance community. And of course, the legal community has really got a lot to answer for. 
because if you know that you are working for fossil fuels and you know that fossil fuels produce greenhouse gas which pollute the earth and are killing the earth then you have to be asking yourself some very serious questions why am i doing this and this is a conversation that is beginning uh, within certain sections of the legal profession and there's another point I think that I want to make here too is the disproportionate impact of greenhouse gas pollution so the people who bear the brunt of this are not the people who actually caused it and there's a sort of for want of a better term uh, climate apartheid because the, you know some people are benefiting others are not on the climate, climate science, yes, there's so much that needs to be done to get the information in front of the judges. The IPCC reports are obviously a very good starting point, but they are conservative because they look at or everything that's been written, including the research that has been funded by fossil fuel sector companies, um, which therefore then dilutes the conclusions. The situation is much much worse than the IPCC reports are telling us and that's why scientists are gluing themselves to buildings because they don't know how else to get the attention of the policy makers. We have to get the information before the judges and in one of the cases in the United States Judge Alsop actually held tutorials um, and that was I think a really good way to get the science into the court. But it's going to take a while, it's going to take a long time I think and we don't have a long time. When you've got the head of the World Bank who can say he's not really sure about climate science, then you know we have a serious problem with the institutions that make the decisions. And the World Bank is governed by international law, so I bring it in because technically it's an outlaw. It's not subject to any national jurisdiction or to any international court. So there you have someone who is outside um, and beyond the reach of the, of literally beyond the reach of the law, an international outlaw. On the finance, look, finance people know that what they're doing is destroying the planet. I think they just don't know how to get out of it. I think I'm <laughs> Tracy, do you have uh, uh, I would just to add, add that um, I think in terms of uh, the legal community, um, you got to have good laws. So you need good facts and you need good law in order to be successful. And in some cases that requires legislation to get better laws. In some instances, particularly with the fossil fuel in industry, it means closing loopholes in our existing federal laws that they enjoy that allows them not to be accountable for the damage they're doing now and to future generations. So I think we, we have to look at the fundamentals of how you bring good lit litigation and see that you have to have good law to start with and you, we have to get rid of those loopholes. In terms of finances, it makes absolutely no sense to continue to throw money at a sinking fossil fuel ship. And I think uh, Tom Sanzillo made it very clear today, if you wanna go for the long-term success in your financial investments, go for renewables, go for where the wave is going. Don't get stuck back with the sinking ship of fossil fuels. It's not sustainable and, it, and we can't afford it anymore. Even though fossil fuels pretend like they're making money, they're only making money for the elite, a very small percent of the population. Everybody else is suffering and having to pay the price of it. So I think, you know, appealing to the economic sense of people who are who understand the, the financial dynamics of energy is really the way to go and by the way they have to stop the subsidies too because it makes no sense for government to be subsidizing this and that goes right to the local government state government all the way up to the federal government please um, hi there, my name's Dana, I'm from the Sunrise Project. Um, sorry, the mic is a little bit high. Um, hearing about the power of local communities um, fighting back against fossil fuel projects um, is really exciting. And I think uh, the thing that 
came to my mind is how it can sometimes feel like whack-a-mole. Sorry, I'll take the mask off to be clear. It can sometimes feel like whack-a-mole as fossil fuel giants and um, you know the financial institutions that fund them can move projects, can move um, you know the uh, the pipelines via road, for example, that Tracy was talking about, or um, Jujin talking about the maritime pipelines. So I'm wondering how communities who are doing this work all over the world locally are able to connect with each other to build power and to be nimble and adaptable as the sites of fossil fuel projects move and as the finance, the financiers also might move jurisdictions or uh, use loopholes, for example, as Tracy was just saying. Thanks. So I think that uh, that's sort course. of the million dollar question. Um, you know, how do we build a movement? Well, there's a lot of fights going on and the, the frontline communities are central to that. But how do you lift all that up and then connect everything so you actually have a movement? I think it's happening. I think Dr. Chavis is right in saying that we're in an inflection point. It's a matter of being self-aware and then taking all that energy that's there and trying to channel it. You know, we have we have coalition that, of organizations and nothing's easy about doing coalition work and connecting over large geographic areas is even harder. But you would think that that's something we can actually do today because of the Internet and the way that we, you know, re remote um, you know, communications, we don't actually have to be in one place at the same time. So it's hard, I admit, um, in order to do that, but I think it's essential. We had we saw a civil rights movement. This is our civil rights movement. If we don't fight for the climate and if we don't fight for stopping the environmental degradation that's being caused by the fossil fuel industry, then we might as well throw in the towel because we're not going to be able to do it without stopping that. Thank you. Um, yes. Think, okay. You think this? Oh, um, I think what you mentioned requires a lot of leadership, um, and I think we've succeeded that with coal. Um, ten years ago, the coal movement. I wasn't in in this world back then, but I believe ten years ago the coal advocacy world was pretty much split up, disorganized, bits and pieces everywhere. Um, that kind of consolidated, consolidated into a very global common language that eventually headed up to COP and made a universal consensus-based decision that coal is no longer the future. Um, that kind of, I would say, leadership will be needed. Uh, it's something that, that a lot of people in this room will have to think about. Um, I guess what we've done around the project in Australia is kind of like a pilot of that. Um, you've seen a lot of communications, legal activity, financial activity, research coming in. And I think these, these can be the seeds of future collaboration and maybe like really, really global scale projects like the Mozambique gas fields can be a point where a lot of the energy of people in this room can gather together. Thank you. Great, thank you. We will take the questions from the online audience first and then I'll go to you, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have two questions from uh, Kate Hudson, not that Kate Hudson, but <laughs> <laughs> she's from Colorado Riverkeeper Alliance. Maybe Tracy knows her. Um, so she asks, what can we do to eliminate the financial support that the oil and gas industry continues to receive, at least in the US, through tax breaks of various kinds? And she also has a follow-up saying, how do we address the dependence of many local and state governments in the Western US on fossil fuel revenues, which specifically support government services in those states, including schools, libraries, et cetera? We also have a question from Matthew Quest. He's asking whether Melinda can tell us about the status of the Radzik and Henry litigation in the LIASA 1 permit. So those are the online questions. Yes, Tracy, probably this is quite specific on the US oil and gas, and then, you know, like the support from the businesses. I didn't well quite the... catch all the question, Hinden. Okay. <laughs> can we do to... Yeah, okay, the question again is, um, how can we eliminate the financial support that the oil and gas industry is getting? Um, 
through continued tax breaks of various kinds in the US. Right. And the second part of that is what do communities who rely on those revenues, on tax revenues, uh, what do they do if those revenues disappear? Yeah, yeah. I, I think this is a very difficult nut to crack. Um, one thing that we're doing right now is we're exploring and investigating um, what these subsidies, tax breaks, um, these uh, this financial support um, is actually is because a lot of people just don't know about it. And I think exposing the public to the fact that their tax money is being wasted in this way and that with that tax money comes a certain um, tacit agreement between the giver and the taker that they're accepting what the what the giver is doing in their other arenas and you know there's chemical companies in south jersey that paid to build the library and their name is on the you know the, the library but the people there have higher levels of a certain chemical that's being emitted by that company in their blood and as a result there's a higher incidence of disease from being exposed to that so people did not know when they accepted the money for the library that they were going to be poisoned these types of external costs that are continue even though we all talk about it they're still continuing to be foisted onto the public without anybody knowing so right now we're trying to just um do the research to figure out how the particular projects that we're fighting are, are being subsidized in, a, in basically a clandestine way Good. Yeah. Thank you, Tracy. So thank you, Matthew, for your question. Um, the Radzig and Henry case is the one I mentioned where the litigants say that the Environmental Protection Agency acted illegally because it issued a, an environmental permit to ESSO without an environmental impact assessment. ESSO has applied to join that case and we are waiting for the judge to decide whether ESSO can take part in that case or not, and then we'll move on with the main uh, arguments. So we're actually having like two minutes left, and then please like very briefly into the questions, and then we'll go to the speakers, please. Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Asif Iqbal for Pakistan. I work with the international NGO Islamic Relief in Pakistan and also volunteer with Al Gore's Climate Reality Project. Uh, my question is, don't you think there is some sort of disconnect among the local movements in the global, uh, uh, like all the movements that is taking place, uh, which uh, the, for example, the, the movements you talked about uh, in your countries, uh, but we see that the, the emissions have no boundaries. You're talking about the uh, expected uh, disasters that you may confront, but we are also witnessing and embracing the brunt of climate change uh, in a country like Pakistan. So do, don't you think that there should be some uh, sort of uh, great uh, uh, coordination among the movements in different parts of the world that can really strengthen the voice against these impacts? Because if there is some dirty fossil fuel projects in any part of the world it's not just one part that's being affected okay the there are impacts in the uh, in the developed countries but they they can recover more quickly than the countries like pakistan and bangladesh so uh, how you see the potential of uh, strengthening these local movements no i, I i'm trying to figure out what the disconnect was the acoustics up here is, is not as good as down there. We couldn't, we couldn't quite hear everything Zester that was said. And, and the more local impacts. Yeah. Uh, disaster, I mean, global climate scale disaster. And the um, local impacts and the disaster. The climate. Well, basically, in order to affect greenhouse gas emissions, we've got a look at the facts. We know that methane has is 86 times more powerful than uh, carbon in heating the atmosphere. We know that it's strategically really important to target methane 
as a greenhouse gas that's driving climate change. And that is the problem that we face today with the spurring of new gas development in order to feed the LNG uh, market overseas. Um, I think, you know, as far as how we do it, we have to do it one well at a time, and then we've got to build that one well at a time through every single piece of infrastructure, such as the pipelines and the compressors and the liquefiers. We have to look at it from all the different pieces of the monster. And then when we, when we can then put together a strategic plan to stop those emissions, now, we have a global movement to drastically reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2030. We have, for instance, the governor of New Jersey saying that he, he signing on to a global uh, climate agreement, saying that he's on board with that. We have executive orders saying that he's on board with that. And yet they're approving new fossil fuel projects, pipelines, compressors, and the LNG project at the same time. How does that make any sense? So I think we really have to try to be successful at the most local level, working upwards. And that's why we work at the local level, state level, um, at the regional level, at the agency that's in charge of water resources for the Delaware River watershed, we work at the federal level. And I don't think there's any easy answer there, unfortunately. But I, th I think trying to stop it one well at a time is sort of a shorthand way of saying, you gotta stop it at the source. Yes, we fight tight pipelines too, because you figure if you don't have a pipeline, you can't get it there, but what did that lead to? LNG by rail. So this is just, uh, it, you know, they're going to find, the industry's going to find a, wa a way to get rid of it as long as they're trying to make money off of producing gas. Thank you. I think that was a really interesting question about the disconnect, and I just wanted to make a couple of points, if I may. Um, there is a disconnect in responsibility. So the so-called developed countries bear a much greater responsibility for what is happening now than the so-called developing countries. We're often told that, for example, Norway um, is, a, is a model for how to do oil and gas with its sovereign wealth fund. Norway does not have a trillion dollar sovereign wealth fund. Norway has a trillion dollar debt to the earth for its greenhouse gas pollution. We have local impacts and we have global impacts. But, and I'm not trying to put blame here anywhere, but I think what's really important is when you look at the companies that are coming for the resources in the global south, those are generally companies coming from the global north. And it would make things much easier if people in the global north would take action against those companies so we don't have to do it where we are. This is extractivism at its worst when you're dealing with fossil fuel companies because when they go, and they do go eventually, they also leave a huge, horrible mess that has to be cleaned up by people who never benefited from those resources. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so thank you everyone. Unfortunately, the time is so limited with all these three amazing speakers. So please join me in giving like all the big applause to all these amazing speakers that together with us this afternoon.